Chapter thirty one of the Hand of Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hand of Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter thirty one The Marmoset. Half past twelve was striking as I came out of the terminus, buttoning up my overcoat, and, pulling my soft hat firmly down upon my head, started to walk to Hyde Park Corner. I had declined the services of the several taxi-drivers who had accosted me, and had determined to walk a part of the distance homeward, in order to check the fever of excitement which consumed me. Already I was ashamed of the strange fears which had been mine during the journey, but I wanted to reflect, to conquer my mood, and the midnight solitude of the land of squares which lay between me and Hyde Park appealed quite irresistibly. There is distinct pleasure to be derived from a solitary walk through London, in the small hours of an April morning, provided one is so situated as to be capable of enjoying it. To appreciate the solitude and mystery of the sleeping city, a certain sense of prosperity, a knowledge that one is immune from the necessity of being abroad at that hour, is requisite. The tramp, the midnight policeman, and the coffee-stall keeper know more of London by night than most people, but of the romance of the dark hours they know little romance succumbs before necessity i had good reason to be keenly alive to the aroma of mystery which pervades the most commonplace thoroughfare after the hum of the traffic has subsided when the rare pedestrian and the rarer cab alone traverse the deserted highway with more intimate care seeking to claim my mind it was good to tramp along the echoing empty streets and to indulge in imaginative speculation regarding the strange things that night must shroud in every big city I have known the solitude of deserts, but the solitude of London is equally fascinating. He whose business or pleasure had led him to traverse the route which was mine on this memorable night must have observed how each of the squares composing that residential chain which links the outer with the inner society has a popular and exclusive side. The angle used by vehicular traffic in crossing the square from corner to corner invariably is rich in a crop of blackboard-bearing house-agents' announcements. In the shadow of such a board I paused, taking out my case and leisurely selecting a cigar. So many of the houses in the southwest angle were unoccupied that I found myself taking quite an interest in one a little way ahead, from the hall door and from the long conservatory over the porch light streamed out. Accepting these illuminations, there was no light elsewhere in the square to show which houses were inhabited and which vacant. I might have stood in a street of Pompeii or Thebes, a street of the dead past. I permitted my imagination to dwell upon this idea as I fumbled for matches and gazed about me. I wondered if a day would come when some savant of a future land, in a future age, should stand where I stood and endeavour to reconstruct from the crumbling ruins this typical London square. A slight breeze set the hatchet-board creaking above my head as I held my gloved hands above the pine vesta. At that moment someone, or something, whistled close beside me. I turned in a flash, dropping the match upon the pavement. There was no lamp near the spot whereat I stood, and the gateway and porch of the deserted residence seemed to be empty. I stood there peering in the direction from which the mysterious whistle had come. The drone of a taxicab approaching from the north increased in volume, as the vehicle came spinning around the angle of the square, passed me, and went droning on its way. I watched it swing around the distant corner, and, in the new stillness, the whistle was repeated. This time the sound chilled me. The whistle was pitched in a curious, inhuman key, and it possessed a mocking note that was strangely uncanny. Listening intently and peering towards the porch of the empty house, I struck a second match, pushed the iron gate open, and made for the steps, sheltering the feeble flame with upraised hand. As I did so, the whistle was again repeated, but from some spot further away, to the left of the porch, and from low down upon the ground. Just as I glimpsed something moving under the lee of the porch, the match was blown out, for I was hampered by the handbag which I carried. Thus reminded of its presence, however, I recollected that my pocket-lamp was in it. Quickly opening the bag, I took out the lamp, and, passing around the corner of the steps, directed a ray of light into the narrow passage which communicated with the rear of the building. Halfway along the passage, looking back at me over its shoulder and whistling angrily, was a little marmoset. I pulled up as sharply as though the point of a sword had been held at my throat. One marmoset is sufficiently like another to deceive the ordinary observer, but unless I was permitting a not unnatural prejudice to influence my opinion, this particular specimen was the pet of Dr. Fu Manchu. 
excitement not untinged with fear began to grow up within me hyde park was no far cry this was near to the heart of social london yet somewhere close at hand it might be watching me as i stood lurked perhaps the great and evil being who dreamed of overthrowing the entire white race with a grotesque grimace and a final chattering whistle the little creature leapt away out of the beam of light cast by my lamp its sudden disappearance brought me to my senses and reminded me of my plain duty i set off along the passage briskly arrived at a small square yard and was just in time to see the ape leap into a well-like opening before a basement window i stepped to the brink directing the light down into the well i saw a collection of rotten leaves waste paper and miscellaneous rubbish but the marmoset was not visible then i perceived that practically all the glass in the window had been broken a sound of shrill chattering reached me from the blackness of the underground apartment. Again I hesitated. What did the darkness mask? The note of a distant motor horn rose clearly above the vague throbbing which is the only silence known to the town dweller. Gripping the unlighted cigar between my teeth, I placed my bag upon the ground and dropped into the well before the broken window. To raise the sash was a simple matter, and, having accomplished it, I inspected the room within. The light showed a large kitchen with torn wallpaper and decorator's litter strewn about the floor, a whitewash pail in one corner, and nothing else. I climbed in, and, taking from my pocket the browning pistol without which I never travelled since the return of the dreadful Chinaman to England, I crossed to the door, which was ajar, and looked out into the passage beyond. Stifling an exclamation, I fell back a step. Two gleaming eyes stared straightly into mine. The next moment I had forced a laugh to my lips, as the marmoset turned and went gambling up the stairs. The house was profoundly silent. I crossed the passage and followed the creature which now was proceeding, I thought, with more of a set purpose. Out into a spacious and deserted hallway it led me, where my cautious footsteps echoed eerily, and ghostly faces seemed to peer down upon me from the galleries above. I should have liked to have unbarred the street door, in order to have opened a safe line of retreat in the event of its being required, but the marmoset suddenly sprang up the main stairway at a great speed, and went racing around the gallery overhead toward the front of the house. Determined, if possible, to keep the creature in view, I started in pursuit. Up the uncarpeted stairs I went, and, from the rail of the landing, looked down into the blackness of the hallway apprehensively. Nothing stirred below. The marmoset had disappeared between the half-opened leaves of a large folding door. Casting the beam of light ahead of me, I followed. I found myself in a long, lofty apartment, evidently a drawing-room. Of the quarry I could detect no sign, but the only other door of the room was closed, therefore. Since the creature had entered, it must, I argued, undoubtedly be concealed somewhere in the apartment. Flashing the light about to right and left, I presently perceived that a conservatory— no doubt facing on the square, ran parallel with one side of the room. French windows gave access to either end of it, and it was through one of these, which was slightly opened, that the questioning ray had intruded. I stepped into the conservatory. Linen blinds covered the windows, but a faint light from outside found access to the bare, tiled apartment. Ten paces to my right, from an aperture once closed by a square wooden panel that now lay upon the floor, the marmoset was grimacing at me. Realizing that the ray of my lamp must be visible through the blinds from outside, I extinguished it, and, a moving silhouette against a faintly luminous square, I could clearly distinguish the marmoset watching me. There was a light in the room beyond. The marmoset disappeared, and I became aware of a faint incense-like perfume. Where had I met with it before? Nothing disturbed the silence of the empty house wherein I stood, yet I hesitated for several seconds to pursue the chase further. The realization came to me that the hole in the wall communicated with the conservatory of the corner house in the square, the house with the lighted windows. Determined to see the thing through, I discarded my overcoat and crawled through the gap. The smell of burning perfume became almost overpowering, as I stood upright, to find myself almost touching curtains of some semi-transparent golden fabric draped in the door between the conservatory and the drawing-room. Cautiously, inch by inch, I approached my eyes to the slight gap in the draperies, as, from somewhere in the house below, sounded the clangor of a brazen gong. Seven times its ominous note boomed out. I shrank back into my sanctuary. 
the incense seemed to be stifling me end of chapter thirty one